Welcome back. We're discussing the turmoil in South Africa with ongoing labor strikes and public service protests and looking at how the new government of President Jacob Zuma is trying to address the problems. Joining me from Johannesburg is Lebohang Mokwena, a political columnist and researcher for the Center for Policy Studies and a political columnist specializing in poverty and youth development issues. Also with us from Cape Town is Ferial Hafaji, a newly appointed editor-in-chief of Johannesburg City Press and formerly the editor of The Mail and Guardian. She was the first non-white woman editor of a major newspaper in South Africa. Good to have them both here. And uh, Lebohang, if I can get back to you there in uh, Johannesburg and put a question that we got from our uh, Twitter site, uh, from our Twitter page. Um, a viewer says, politicians made promises not to forget, not to fulfill them. Oh, sorry, politicians make promises to forget, not to fulfill them. Zuma is no different from others in the world. Election over, promise over. Now, do you believe that uh, Jacob Zuma promised too much too soon? Look, I do think that to some extent um, he did tap into people's expectations in a very big way. Um, and I do think that the proximity that he created between himself while he was electioneering and key members of the party as well as the, um, the citizens gave the impression that there would be quite a speedy resolution to a lot of the issues that they were having. Um, and so to a large extent, I do think that the, the people to whom Jacob Zuma really appealed are the people who really have nothing else to hold him you know, to hold them to account, except the fact that he made those promises. Obviously, these are people who are also not will, well, not necessarily in a position to be waiting for lengthy uh, policy debates and lengthy policy implementation processes because they believe they've been waiting for very long and that the prom, you know, the president did make it very clear that some of the issues would be dealt with quite speedily. Um, and I think that yes, while you know a lot of people are very cynical. Through, were very cynical throughout the election process to say, well, how is the president planning to, you know, really deal with all of these things that he's promising um, to the average man on the street and the, to the average woman on the street who wanted to get a job? That's all that they could hold the president to. And you know, we're seeing some of the, you know, some of those people saying, well, we'd like enforcement on this. Right. We'd like implementation on the basis of the president's word. Let's get a call in from Tennessee here in the USA. Abdi is on the phone with us. Abdi, what would you like to ask? Well, the question I have for your guest is, uh, what is the South African government will do about uh, the anti-immigration, especially the killing of the Somali people, uh, the refugees in Kenya, I mean in uh, South Africa? Right. And uh, also, I just want to remind her that Somalia did contribute to the independence of South Africa because we were one of the African countries that helped the ANC. But today, okay. it's not fair that the South Africans kill our people. Abdi, I'm going to put this to Ferial Hafaji and ask, there, was, there were of course these uh, xenophobic riots and sort of killings that were taking place in South Africa last year. People are worried with the economic situation getting so bad again that the target will be of course immigrants, um, people who you know might be seen as taking jobs and so on. What danger is there of that? I think, Riz, it's more than a danger. It's a reality, very, very sadly. And just to respond to Abdi there, we've been talking to a journalist called Hassan Isilo, who is a Somalian journalist working in South Africa. And he has given us some fairly horrifying reports of numbers of Somalians killed, uh, mostly in the townships around the Cape. Why is that? It's because Somalians here are enormously entrepreneurial. They've started businesses. South Africans, stifled by apartheid, never developed those instincts. And so all the shops, many shops in the townships, run by Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Somalians, Ethiopians. And it's those people who've come into the first line of attack in the past fortnight. For me, this is a real priority along any number of others which our government faces because like Abdi says, we know we owe our liberation to other countries in Africa which welcomed us and which funded the, the liberation struggle. And for me, this is one of the most shameful moments we are now facing. Well, Echuka is on the line from Nigeria. Let's get uh, Echuka on. Yeah, this is Echuka from Nigeria. Hi, go ahead. Um, so well, yeah, post independence, Riz, the problem we have been having across Africa is that we have left our communities, um, our communities, our villages, and we are crowding out the cities. The government don't care about the rural communities where much of uh, the jobs and um, employment. 
Uh, actually, let me get let me get, let me get this to Le Bokang. Let me get this to Le Bokang, uh, and ask uh, to what degree is that a danger? The country is being split into into basically two populations: the the rural and the urban. Look, I mean, I think there are very clear and very dire. Um, there's a clear divide between the rural poor and the urban poor. Um, and I do think that, you know, increasingly there is a recognition on the part of the government that South Africa's development will not necessarily be run on, you know, um, urbanization and, you know, the service industries that are based in urban areas, but that there does need to be a refocus around rural development, particularly around the land question and agricultural production, and making sure that people do, you know, the vast majority of the poor who are in rural areas are able to at least get meaningful work in, um, in the agricultural industry. But again, these are the types of solutions that, or at least these are the types of policy approaches and tendencies that are quite recent. And the emphasis is quite recent. Um, and so we're still waiting to understand quite cogently exactly what the government plans to do. There have been plans, at least there has been some talk about recapacitating uh, the land bank, which is essentially um, the key financial institution for the agricultural sector in South Africa. And expediting the, the the land reform process but obviously again these are things that take much longer there's a lot of negotiation that has to do on the part of commercial farmers as well as subsistence farmers but yes there is quite a clear divide and there is quite a clear necessity for very different policy responses for urban poverty right. and rural poverty well Lee's on the line from South Africa Lee good to have you with us there from South Africa go ahead please Thank you. Um, uh, there's just two comments that I'd like to make. Uh, is that uh, um, first of all, the South African government is overextending itself as far as expenditure, and the reason I think the expenditure has been done is because there's a lot of corruption, and people are issuing contracts left, right, and centre, especially building the highways and the roads in all directions from the standards, from Johannesburg, and they are going just about everywhere. Instead of using that money to to build highways, okay. why don't they use that same money and build houses and put in some kind of infrastructure okay, Lee, for the local people? What's the other point? Was, okay, was, if that's it, then let me get this to Fariel. Uh, Fariel, let, let me ask you about that. The, the, the issue of corruption, that's one thing that uh, obviously uh, people are very concerned with. Um, is, is there an issue that perhaps the ANC, it's not just Jacob Zuma, but the ANC, having been in power now for uh, 15 years, has become perhaps a little complacent, isn't monitoring things and good governance as well as it should, and, and issues such as corruption are overtaking uh, uh, the day-to-day -day running of the, the, the party? Absolutely. A recent report out of our Auditor General's office um, suggested that 600 million rand worth of con contracts been for the things like building roads, building houses, for the, the basics of development, was in fact being diverted to companies associated with civil servants or otherwise directly owned by them, which in another word really is corruption and patronage. So I think once we be able to, once we start to calculate the the dividends of development going into the pockets of our civil servants will see that it's becoming a real impediment and it is something which Jacob Zuma has promised to tackle head on knowing of course that he came to office with those corruption charges hanging over his head and one thing you must give credit for is that in the first two months of his administration we have seen a number of high profile uh, cases being tackled fulsomely. Well, let's get uh, Shokat on the line from the United Kingdom. Shokat, what would you like to ask? Yeah, good evening. Good evening. I'd like to say um, South Africa faces many problems, violence, lack of um, houses, low wages, immigration problem, and lack of security. Um, isn't it important for all groups to work the problem out rather than seek blame and conf uh, confrontation? Thank you. Thanks for that. That's an interesting point. Uh, uh, Fariel, you could take on that, that uh, question that we had from Shokat there in the UK. Well, that's certainly something that we're looking forward to because one of the big buzzwords of our president is engagement, that he is going to bring um, various interest groups together to talk to each other. Unfortunately, one of the critiques he's faced in the past two weeks is that he hasn't really 
altered his normal governing agenda to get out on the streets to talk to people um, and to hear what they're feeling and saying. So we're hoping that at least in the next month that that will begin to happen. Um, at the moment, he's on a two-month-long tour around the country to say thank you for the ringing victory which people gave to him in the April election. But it seems to me as if that moment is past now. Now, fair enough, the other issue is, of course, that there's the economic crisis, global economic crisis, uh, and uh, I guess there is the issue of investors worrying about um, trying to keep the, the status quo and not spending money on, on these kind of uh, uh, re renewal projects, whereas, you know, the poorer communities obviously want some kind of support financially. How is the government going to balance between foreign investors looking for certain things and the, and the people looking for something else? Well, foreign investors seem to be fairly happy with South Africa at the moment. Uh, Moody's gave us an upgrade less than uh, two weeks ago. And one of the things that really is benefiting us is the massive, massive spending of uh, millions, hundreds, uh, tens of millions of US dollars flowing into our economy because of all the stadiums we're building, because of the infrastructure plans ahead of the 2010 World Cup. So we're hoping that it is football that will keep the wolf from our door. Right. Many people here are saying that we should begin to peak out of this recession um, within the next quarter at least. So on that front, at least there are some green shoots right. of hope. Well, Le Bukhang, literally 30 seconds to go, so a very quick answer. What's the prospect for the youth? I mean, young people saw 15 years ago a complete change in the country. What prospect for them now with the way things are? Look, I mean, I think the real prospects for, the, for young people lie in enhancing uh, the education system and making sure that we produce young people who actually go through the, not just the schooling system, but also the university system and the technical training. And um, to, you know, there's, the, there's been some rationalization of cabinet and the education department right. to try and streamline functions and focus primarily on tertiary education. So okay. hopefully, you know, they will, over the next five years, we'll see some good reform well, and young people will be going through the system with qualifi qualifications. Right. Lebukang and uh, Fariel, I want to thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for being with us too. On the next show, is Honduras any closer to resolving its constitutional crisis? On Monday, the Honduran uh, Congress was set to debate a proposal to end the deadlock. Even though his ousting was condemned by the international community, the former leader's future is uncertain as he remains camped on his country's border, facing arrest if he returns. Don't forget, follow me uh, for updates on Twitter. You can tweet your questions and comments. But that's it for me and the team. We'll see you next time.